Okay, well, thank you very much, Ross, um, for that introduction. And um, as Ross has said, in this lecture, um, I'm going to give, first of all, a brief introduction to how I became involved in the study of tourism, why it cannot be simply described as an industry or business, why tourism is a dirty word, before thinking about the many different types of tourism there are, and going on to give my perspective on what tourism is. I shall be using examples from my research, which has mainly been among tourists in the Mediterranean island um, of Mag Mallorca in the resorts specifically of Palmanova and Magaluf. Before I begin, however, I'd like to express my thanks to several people who have helped me to reach the point I stand here now giving this lecture. Firstly, I thank all of you for being here. I'm really honoured that um, you have uh, wanted to come and listen to me speak. I'd like to thank the organisers of this event, Jen and Sandra, who have been standing outside helping you find your way in. I'd like to say a special thank you to Amanda Mannion for the courage. And thank you to all the people who over the years have taken part in my research from tourists, resort workers to local authority staff. A special thank you to Professor Tom Selwyn. Tom has inspired me, supported me and guided me since 1995 and I feel truly indebted to him for the faith he has kept in me in my academic journey. I have never stopped being his student. Last but not least, I must also thank my family, my children, Ella and Mark, but especially my husband, Dr. Les Roberts, who has always been there for me. So, where did this all begin? It began at the start of the 1990s with the desire to see the world, whilst at the same time to find myself. In terms of the former, that desire to see the world, I did see some of the world backpacking with my now husband through parts of Southeast Asia. And here I am in Derba Square, Kathmandu. From Southeast Asia, going on to live for a year in Australia before returning to the UK via New Zealand and the United States. Did I find myself? No, I'm still looking. <laughs> What the travel did, though, was to open my eyes and provoke an even greater interest in the world out there. On my return to the UK, I became interested in the impacts that touristic travel was having on the places that I had visited, and I decided to study a Master's in International Tourism Policy. My initial intention was to, to use this, this uh, you know, once I got the Master's, as an entry into going into planning in a local authority, which when I reflect on it now just seems mad. To keep things brief, the MA led me to thinking about the figure of the tourist in a much deeper way than I had previously, and also led me to the by now well-worn observation and written under very different circumstances by the French poet Charles Baudelaire that goes something like this. It always seems to me that I will be better off where I am not, and on this question of moving is one that I discuss endlessly with my soul. What is this need to move, the restlessness that seems to be part of being human, and why can't we just be satisfied where we are? If we look across cultures and back through time, we see that the trope of travel appears again and again, and often with the link to the idea that if we could only get somewhere else, we would feel better, life would be better. And I'll come back to that point. Before I go on to say what um, I think tourism is, it's worth saying what it is not. Tourism is not an industry, it is not a business. Although it is easy to slip into discussing the tourism industry, and I do do that myself, it is quite hard at times not to refer to tourism as an industry, so strong are the pressures of activities within the, the advanced capitalist environment that seeks to measure, manage and market as much as possible. But tourism is not an industry. A junk professor for several US-based universities and head of a market research and strategic planning consultancy in New York, Thomas Lee Davidson, now sadly deceased, argued in 2005 Considerable effort has been devoted to creating this impression that tourism is a legitimate industry. At best, it is a collection of industries. 
He goes on to suggest that by categorising tourism as an industry works against its important economic role in national and global economies. Now Davidson and I are probably at the extreme opposite ends of a continuum in the study of tourism when it comes to what he did in terms of marketing and business type stuff and what I do as a social anthropologist. But on this point we concur that tourism isn't an industry but made up from multiple different things, transport, banking, catering, and so on. If tourism is not an industry, then it's most clearly not a single business. Although tourism businesses clearly exist, and they include many facets of the business world. Supply chains, project management, marketing, enterprise, HR, accounting, and the law, and so on and so on. Davidson is also correct that tourism is important economically. It is worth trillions of dollars to the global economy on a yearly basis. And this diagram illustrates in part the complexity of what tourism is, as it shows the multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary potential that tourism as a subject of study has. Although I agree with Davidson that tourism is not an industry and therefore is not a business, where I diverge from Davidson's thinking is thinking about tourism is that tourism as an industry, if you think about tourism as an industry, it obscures the economic value of tourism. If anything, it promotes it. How can we get money? How can we make more money? This misses the whole value of tourism as a means to understand the socio-cultural world from which it emerges and to which it contributes to shaping and thus misses understanding how and why it is lived. Tourism is a dirty word and often not taken seriously. It's well rehearsed that tourism development brings costs and benefits, and in recent years, the term over-tourism has crept into the academic literature to stand for the increasing issues of overcrowding that many tourist destinations now face. For example, Venice, Amsterdam and Barcelona. My idea that tourism is a dirty word, however, without dismissing the very important contemporary debates, really stems from the reaction to tourism and tourists that first emerged with the foundation of modern tourism and continues in the present day. The foundations of what we understand as organised tourism in the contemporary world has its roots in the 1800s and the temperance movement. It is usually well known that the first organised trip was put together by Thomas Cook, who arranged in July 1841 to take a group of temperance campaigners from Leicester Campbell Street Railway Station to a teetotal rally in Loughborough. Following on from this, Cook started to arrange more trips and for different reasons, so for example to London for the Great Exhibition. And as his business grew, he organised trips to different parts of Europe. Here, the tourist was looked down upon. No longer were places once enjoyed by the very wealthy and upper classes exclusive to them. And the new form of travellers were described as an invasion from an inferior lower class and, and appearing as if they were part of a circus. <clears throat> Although Cook defended the right for a sort of, I suppose, democratisation of travel, he did share with his critics an underlying view that travel was for educational purposes. I think this prejudice about why people should travel is still prevalent today and has even found its way into academia. In the early days of the academic study of tourism, the tourist was described as an invader, so tourism was an invasion, and that's according to Turner and Ash in 1975 in their book The Golden Horse. More recently, in 2015, writing uh, in the book Reclaiming Travel, Ilan Stavens and Joshua Ellison described tourism as inauthentic, choreographed, sterile, shallow. And tourism as an area worthy of academic study has also been derided. So, for example, Pierre Vandenberg wrote in the foreword to his book Tourism and the Other, judging by the smirk which the mere mention of tourism brings to the face of my colleagues, most social scientists do not take tourism seriously. Most recently, when putting together an abstract for a journal special issue, the editor-in-chief of the journal commented, 
For me, tourism simply raises a red flag. Why add tourism unless you're looking at marketing issues, economic aspects? Tourism then and the tourists get a bad press. Much better to say you're a traveller, even if you do get on a plane and stay in a hotel. So what is tourism? I suggest that tourism is probably one of the most adjectival, described, prefix activities there is. So this word cloud is based on 150 different descriptions or types of tourism. When I first set out to looking into this and to develop a word cloud, I thought it would be good if I could, could get to 20 different types. Then I thought I can get to 50 different types of tourism and that would be okay. And the more I searched, the more I had to keep upping the number of the different types of descriptions that are out there of tourism. And um, I needed it to be neat, so I couldn't have it at like 93 types of tourism. That wouldn't have satisfied me. So this is 150 because I had to draw the line somewhere um, and 150 satisfies me as a number. But then having said that, since I made the word cloud, since I drew the line and said no more um, playing around with the word cloud, I have found another three types of tourism. Benefits tourism, primitive tourism and anti-tourism. I could read the whole list, but I'm not going to. But I am just going to comment on a few of these descriptions. Some I find irritating, e.g., for example, dark tourism, cultural tourism. Some make me laugh, for example, horse tourism. And some I find deeply disturbing, for example, transplant tourism. Of course, descriptions of tourism come in part from a need for some people to distinguish from being the tourist, the lowest of the low, and most certainly not a mass tourist, whatever that means. And of course, for the market to carve itself into an increasing number of niches to give the impression it's doing something new and has something new to sell. But whether you're going on holiday to ride a bike, to go backpacking, to visit a waterfall or hang out in a cave, it's all tourism and fundamentally it all involves people. And because of this, tourism is first and foremost a fundamentally human pursuit that answers a need to travel. It's also worth observing that although tourism is seen by some as an industry as being related to business, and if we were to look at where tourism is taught it, in the UK, it's predominantly within business schools, <coughs> tourism crops up all over the place. Media and communication, environmental science, music, health, arts. And this too speaks to the fact that tourism cannot simply be pigeonholed. So what I'd like to do now is to draw from aspects of my work to illustrate the multifaceted, people-centred practice that tourism is. So tourism is about our imaginations. People imagine a life elsewhere has deep roots in time and across cultures. The search for a better life that exists away from the quotidian and habitation of the world characterised by work and at times deprivation is connected to the trope of travel, as I've said, across cultures and through time. Religious beliefs are often the basis for ideas that the problems and toil of everyday life can be overcome by reaching another place, heaven or paradise. In the Middle Ages in Western Europe, there were many fantasies about worlds where the hardships of life did not exist. One such fantasy was about the land of cocaine. It was expressed in artwork and the painting by Hieronymus Bosch, The Garden of Earthly Delights, speaks to some of these ideas in some ways. Cocaine was a country tucked away in some remote corner of the globe where ideal living conditions prevailed. This imagined world of cocaine provided a stark contrast to the hardships of life. Work was forbidden. Food and drink sprang automatically in one's mouth, and it was also possible to eat one's surroundings. It was also always sp spring. Life was peaceful. There was plenty of opportunity for sex without commitment. Everyone had beautiful clothes. There was a fountain of youth, and money could be earned during one's sleep. Anyone who could break wing convincingly earned half a crown. 
and belching three times or letting a very loud fart would get you a sovereign. It was a world in which there was an emphasis on the central pleasures of life, where the body was at ease with itself. It was believed that cocaine could be found in the world beyond that of Europe, and that some had already visited it. In fact, Christopher Columbus was apparently, in part, driven by a search for the paradise on Earth, the cocaine kind of world, as he was for trying to reach the East by going West. The othering of the other that emerged in the stories about the places and peoples encountered on the journeys undertaken as part of this so-called age of discovery were, in effect, sexed up to sell and fill the imagination further. We see echoes of this in contemporary tourism, images presented and promises made. So this um, other image of the tourist is from Tahiti, and Tahiti is promoted as um, the myth of the last paradise, so close to the original purity. Islands of beauty, love and of passion, an invitation beyond the ordinary. But also, cocaine wasn't about education. It was about finding warmth, comfort, enjoyment, self-indulgence, and these are integral parts of some touristic practice today. I'm now going to show a very short video clip of um, Magaloo from Palmanova, which does have flashing lights in it, so I hope that's okay with everyone. <laughs> As we've just seen, part of tourism is about visual culture. Firstly, when we think about forthcoming holidays, we propel ourselves forward, imagining what it would be like to be in that place. It's in our mind's eye. Tourism is also a visual rich practice. Images of places and peoples are used to sell destinations in brochures and other related marketing material. These help us to imagine where it is we are going. But we also get ideas of places from a plethora of other sources, the films, TV programmes we watch, the books we read, and so on. Seeing the sights has been a staple of touristic practice since the early days, and recording of those sights and our related experiences has equal, equally been part of the practice of tourism, again since its beginnings, from travel writing and sketchbooks to taking photos and collecting and or sending postcards. Increasingly, with the emergence of digital culture and social media, we want to share our experiences even more. Instagram, Facebook, WhatsApp, Snapchat, etc. Things that I don't even know exist. And with a wider audience of people, some of whom we don't even know, and we create our stories as we go. Taking a picture increasingly mediates touristic practice. We take photos and videos of scenery, other people, ourselves, food, and so on. The world around us is often increasingly viewed through the lens of a smartphone rather than directly by eye. So this um, image on the very left is uh, when I went to the Vermeer exhibition in Amsterdam at the end of March, and much of my initial viewings of the paintings was through the smartphones of other people as they were all crowded around the pictures. Um, taking photos. And that taking a picture or the picture becomes the most important thing. <coughs> to 
Tourism is a story we tell ourselves about ourselves. My work has been mainly based in the tourist resorts of Palma Nova and Magaloop on Mallorca. And if you haven't been, I do recommend that you go. The resorts exist like an enclave. <coughs> they are predominantly patronised by British, and I use that word very advisedly, tourists, and many of the facilities have been aimed at them, often emphasising ideas of a particular kind of Britishness and attempting to appeal to ideas about home. So this is the Prince William Mini, which is used to advertise the Prince William Pub that sits between the two resorts and has been a popular starting point for bar crawls organised by tour operators for British tourists through Magaluf. Next door, and not in the picture, is a much smaller takeaway named the Prince Harry. And the picture on the right is a scene from Pirate's Adventure. This is some of the audience. So Pirate's Adventure is a nighttime entertainment, largely consisting of an acrobatic performance that is set to a story of so-called British pirates in conflict with an evil French pirate called Jack Lafitte. Of course, the story ends with the defeat of Lafitte and the British triumphant. And these kind of, the appeal to this sense of Britishness appeal, appears again and again, drawing attention to past military greatness as well as contemporary cultural signifiers. So, Bar Trafalgar, Lord Nelson, EastEnders. Although the landscape of both resorts is changing with a shifting political economy, it is still possible, even in 2023, to visit the Red Lion, Benny Hills and the Britannia pubs. You can still drink a pint of carling, and I mean a pint, served in a pint glass, and eat British food, bread, sausages, bacon. All these things feed into and off an imagining of what it is to be British and are often set in opposition to the foreign other that includes not only the French, as in Pirates of Venture, but also the Germans and the Spanish. Tourism is about material culture. From the size of the luggage we choose to take up with us to enable us to pass more quickly through the airport, or not, depending on the size of the luggage, to the clothes that we might take with us, for some specially bought and only ever used for their holidays beach towels, buckets and spades and other toys, as well as objects from everyday life, furniture, plates, crockery, that provides the props for touristic practice. And of course the souvenir, these things sold to be given as gifts or put on display when we get home as a reminder of the good time we had. When I was doing my fieldwork in Magaluf, I was intrigued by the plethora of pig souvenirs and pig imagery on postcards available in the resort. The fridge magnets and little ornaments on the beach, as featured in the image on the right, all strike a tourist pose of sunbathing or playing on the beach or in the sea. My analysis of this piggy-infused landscape led me to think about the place of the pig as a symbol of a particular kind of British identity that both abhors the pig but also deifies it as fighting for freedom in the face of a once encroaching EU. Thank you, Daily Mail, for that insight. The objects also tell us something about the holiday, the holiday taking practices in the resort. So sunbathing, and also to Magaluf's reputation as Shagaluf, because of its renown for being a place of opportunity for casual sexual relations. It is the case that the resort has been a highly charged sexual environment, and echoes of medieval cocaine are evident here, sex without obligation. Tourism is about our bodies. The visual practice of tourism and the staple tourism activity of sightseeing are, are very much ocular pursuits. But tourism engages the whole body, all of the senses. The smell of the drains in Spain indicating to one tourist that she knew she was not at home in the UK. The importance of eating pigs on holiday in the form of the ubiquitous fry-up that only tastes right if the sausages and bacon come from the UK. The sounds of the nightclub, too much noise to sleep, not enough noise to be entertained. Touching others, friends and old family to rub sun cream in, to hold hands, to dance together. And the very idea of what the holiday is supposed to be about, 
a sense of freedom that becomes embodied in the unbuckling of the body as you let it all hang out. Overflowing beer bellies topped with sunbathing. The central body at ease with itself, rewarded for overindulgence. If you drink too much and throw it up, you're a hero. In the case of Magaluf, and to some degree also Parmanova, the focus has been on the sexualised body, and particularly the sexualised bodies of women. Nighttime entertainment in the hotels and bars that involved sexual position games. In Pirates Adventure, with regular calls for women to get their tits out for the boys. Numerous souvenirs based on sexualised parts of women's bodies and pornographic postcards. In the main period of my fieldwork, this objectification and sexualisation of women that far outweighed that of the sexualisation and objectification of men left me feeling very angry with men. However, in a return to the field, I started to realise I had I just not really taken on board the number of penises on display. Although the sexualisation of men and display of penises was still not equal to that display of women's breasts and their general sexualisation, I did calm down and on reflection started to feel a bit sorry for men as they actually came across as being really rather needy. So there's no such thing as tourism. What I hope I've done in this lecture is to show you that how varied tourism is and how it cannot be thought about <coughs> as one thing. It involve, involves all areas of life. It tells us about how we understand the world how we create the world, what we hope from the world. Recently, the Garden newspaper carried an article about colour. It recognised that colours are understood differently by different people in different cultural contexts. For example, some cultures have several words for green. Some people only recognise three colours, black, white, red. The conclusion was there is no such thing as colour. There are only the people who perceive it. Tourism comes into being through practice. It touches all areas of our lives and all areas of our lives touch tourism. It means different things to different people and so there's no such thing as tourism, only the people who practice it. I have one more slide. My research about people in the context of tourism has been through ethnography, participant observation. When I explain this to people, it often gets a similar reaction to the one Van den Berg encountered, that of an amusement and a sort of, yeah, right. When I explain that I had to go sunbathing, go on island tours, take part in bar crawls, go clubbing, or attend other forms of nighttime entertainment. It sounds more fun, perhaps, than it was. It actually had numerous challenges, not least being a lone woman in an environment underpinned by an understanding that everyone was up for it, that is casual sex, or encountering people like the punter in one nightclub who told me the first thing he noticed about me was the best way to kill me, which was a bit disconcerting. <laughs> Nevertheless, I would not conduct my research in any other way. Ethnography has its roots in the early days of the discipline of social anthropology and Branislaw Malinowski is often referred to as the pioneer in the field. But what of the early women? They too paved the way for allowing me to stand here this evening as a professor. I therefore thank and dedicate my lecture to Kathleen Routledge, who worked on Easter Island and ended her days in Ticehurst House Asylum, East Sussex, all her assets and field notes taken by her estranged husband. Barbara Friero Mareco, who worked in the Pueblos of New Mexico and whose academic career was cut short by her marriage. Winifred Blackman, who worked in Egypt, but unable to return to the country she, she loved, ended her days in Denby Asylum. Beatrice Blackwood, who despite 50 years of service to the University of Oxford, was refused an honorary doctorate by the University Council in 1974. And perhaps most sad of all, Maria Sarplika, who worked in Siberia. Having had her application for funding for further fieldwork rejected in favour of a male colleague known to be an inferior scholar, she committed suicide in Bristol in 1921, aged 37. Thank you.
like to, on behalf of our faculty and the University of Hazel, to give you a, a gift. Oh, thank you. And thank you for the fantastic inaugural lecture and a very moving final ending. Thank you.